this topic kind of emerged from uh, a post-election uh, consoling circuit I've been doing with friends and family and coworkers, um, where people just need to vent and have someone to listen to them. And I don't really have any skills I could offer to help soothe their pain or anxiousness other than listening. So I think the main thing you need to listen is empathy. That's the first step. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about myself. Uh, <laughs> I have been black for my entire life. <laughs> And I am also a first-generation immigrant. I was born and raised in Jamaica. Spent about half my life there and half in New York. So I think that uh, kind of give me, gives me an um, insider-outsider perspective that sometimes helps uh, to connect with people who are not in my in-group. Uh, I'm a front-end engineer by trade at Yieldmill. It's an ad tech startup. Uh, you can find me after if you're interested. And I'm a member of society. Um, I'm not really a fan of the phrase, stay in your lane. I think if we don't claim to be authorities or bearers of objective truths about things that we're not fully aware of, then it's still OK to have an opinion. So I think a lot of you will be in a position to fact check me or call me out on things after this. But uh, just bear with me for now. Thank you. All right. So, <laughs> you make everything about race. Um, that's an actual accusation that's been thrown at me a couple times. Um, and I'll start with a story um, on how I ruined game night multiple times. <laughs> um, uh, we, we have game night at work pretty regular once a week. And one particular week, uh, Cards Against Humanity was the game of choice. And yeah, I heard everyone, so I don't even need to dwell on that. Um, and there were people who understood where I was coming from, and there were people who really couldn't get why I couldn't just let it go and have fun. Uh, why do I have to make a big deal out of everything? But actually, the first time I played Cards Against Humanity, uh, I got dealt, well, no, someone's response to one of the questions was like, Nubile Slave Boy. I'm like, wow, that's like, that immediately conjures up uh, thoughts of sexual exploitation that's been uh, deeply entrenched in the history of uh, slavery in America and around the world. And my first thought is, how can anyone find this entertaining? Like, it's not up to me to let this go. You should probably, like, check your values here. Um, and that's kind of a recurring thing that happens to me where I just can't let things go, and I have a really long boycott list that I can't even keep track of, and hence the accusations. Um, why is this relevant? Uh, because it's 2016 and we still have a hard time acknowledging how privilege sorry, affects our lives. Um, look no further than some of the previous talks. Uh, and I think a lack of empathy aids in scapegoating. Um, the latest presidential election cycle should be proof enough of that. Uh, when you can't see that the people around you are just trying to provide for themselves and their families, uh, and that you don't have as many enemies as you might perceive, then it's really it's really easy for someone to come along and divide and conquer. Um, see Trump for reference. Uh, so I've been throwing this word around, and. What is empathy? Uh, the dictionary definition is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Uh, in this particular case, I think it really means the ability to listen. Uh, that, that is the 
gateway to all forms of progress is to be able to be receptive to perspectives beyond your own, uh, which starts with listening. And uh, I'm not talking about sympathy, not asking for a handout, just an ear. Um, so I'm standing here asking you to care, like, but why should you? Caring is hard. Uh, we all have limited, or what feels like limited, amounts of emotional energy, and it's probably mostly invested in your friends and families. So why should you spare some for someone else who you may not ever know personally? Uh, and it's simply because whew, empathy is the key to understanding the world around you. Uh, you can't broaden your perspective if you're not willing to consider other points of view, which, you, again, cannot, the, the beginning of that is always listening. So even if you disagree with someone and you're about to fact check them and lay the smack down, down, down um, I think taking half a second more to frame your arguments in a, in a way that might be more uh, receptive or appropriate for your audience can help. Uh, empathy also helps build patience and of course uh, if you improve the circumstances of the most marginalized amongst us, then you will inherently improve the circumstances of the whole world, I would think. Uh, so, where do we start? Uh, we start by recognizing that when we talk to people about race, we're often challenging their worldview. Um, ignorance is bliss, and sometimes, uh, incidentally or deliberately, we are not receptive to things that are really obvious to members of marginalized groups. Um, as this comic, these two comics in juxtapose, uh, one, one set of people's primary concern is uh, what to have for brunch. Whereas, uh, you know, I might go home and witness a video of an unarmed person being shot in the back. Uh, and then I have to go to work the next day and listen to people talk about Pilates. And, you know, that can be really taxing. Um, I think as Emily pointed out, it, it takes twice as much energy to get up in the morning sometimes. Uh, and people might not understand why. And when you engage them in a conversation on race and racism, you're already starting from a place of fatigue and uh, de depleted emotional energy that, you know, that can hamper your empathy as well for being patient with, um, with whomever you're engaged with. And at the same time, um, you know, the other side of that is that people also need to take time to exit their, their comfort zone and, you know, be willing to intake uh, troublesome material or observe the world, including all of its ugliness sometimes. Part of that also includes recognizing our discomfort. It says your, but it should really say our discomfort with blackness. I think Mima had a slide before on, on about two talks ago that mentioned that about 50% of black people have a preference for white people and 76% of white people have a preference for white people. Uh, that's not an accident. I mean, if you're told your entire life that you're less than, uh, you. It's easy to internalize that, and then that manifests in sayings like all lives matter, which is usually offered up as a direct response to black lives matter. Um, like we know all lives matter, we don't, we don't need that memo. Uh, so I think uh, 
this is not about finger wagging or, you know, calling people out. It's just about taking this chance to be introspective and being honest with ourselves. And I think that will help us to uh, be more receptive to listening to, understanding, and believing the experiences of others. Uh, and I, I would contend bigotry is not the most dangerous form of racism. Uh, I think we need to stop patting ourselves on the back for not being bigots at some point. Uh, bigotry is now passe. It's, it's, um, it's socially unacceptable if I if I produce hate speech in public forums, I'll probably lose my job. Uh, hate crimes might land me in jail with heightened sentences. But uh, it's the unconscious biases that are really the scary things. Um, for example, uh, my personal fear is of confirmation bias uh, in job interviews. Like It's something I dread. Uh, you never know if the person on the other side of the desk has already sized you up and is just waiting to validate their assessment of you. And I think if we can acknowledge that about ourselves, again, it's another thing that aids us in being more empathetic towards others. Uh, just an interesting point. I, I found this really curious as well. Uh, doctors, some doctors uh, prescribe different pain management treatments to black patients versus white patients uh, based on potentially unconscious bias that blacks are inherently stronger. I was like, what, my pain is different too? Like, it's not something that had even occurred to me, but uh, you know, it's just one of the ways that bias can manifest. And uh, you don't have to be Dr. King to express your point of view. I think one of the most frequent points of frustration for people of color is that um, we're often required to be articulate in order to express our point of view. Um, I'm kind of tripping over my words right now uh, myself, but you guys are being quite patient and I appreciate that. Uh, but we really, we, we shouldn't impose this requirement because uh, when we ask people to be articulate uh, to our standards in order to express their point of view, uh, we have to consider the number of voices that we're alienating at the same time. I know. In my circle, Trump's election kind of came as a surprise uh, because a lot of people dismissed all of the overt, um, the overtly racist harmful, harassing behavior as just like the voice of a small subset. Uh, and what we were really doing was we were eliminating large groups of people who are genuinely frustrated. And uh, it's not so much that they were bigots or racist or misogynist, but they were frustrated with the status quo and are looking for any form of change, any agent of change. Um, and Trump seemed like the most likely candidate for that. Um, and by imposing this requirement for like, must be this smart to opine, we, without realizing, eliminated a lot of those people from the discourse. And also we have to remember that uh, a lot of our martyrs and national heroes, uh, they were detested by the entrenched interests of their time. Uh, Dr. King is now like a venerated hero, but when he was alive, he was beaten, jailed, and uh, ultimately killed. So we have to remember that when we're, we're criticizing a means of protest, uh, that we're not leaving, that we do leave some way for people to, uh, to air their grievances and to express their frustration. Uh, for example, Colin Kaepernick taking a knee during football games. Uh, that's not a lot of backlash, but that seems like a pretty reasonable, peaceful protest. And if it's not, I'd really like an instruction manual.
on what is not. And ultimately, we, as Jamie pointed out earlier, uh, we need to take care of our own mental health. We need to, it's not an option, it is a requirement to be mindful of our own emotional and psychological health. health. So uh, we have to know when to disengage. If, if we're engaged with someone who is uh, clearly not interested in listening, sometimes it's time to cut a loss. Uh, I think what helps is to bear in mind that you're never trying to win an argument when it comes to race. It's simply trying to share uh, your perspective and maybe have the person come away considering a point of view that uh, was previously foreign to them. Um, it's not a competition or a debate, but uh, if, if people are being clearly uh, obstinate to change and listening at some point, just let it go. this will be my last point, which is uh, you don't have to get it to appreciate it. Oftentimes, when, uh, I'll go back to my Cards Against Humanity example, uh, like if you're, uh, to revisit that example, uh, I, I love you to complain against the choice of game for game night. Uh, the the gut reaction is to complain and push back and say, hey, you know what, you're not being reasonable. But uh, in keeping with being empathetic, uh, half a second more of thought might lead you to a different conclusion. Just like sparing an inch of patience might help you to actually see what the other person is talking about. Uh, the subtext is, uh, what if I told you about your mama? Uh, I'll never forget in high school, once I made a your mama joke to a friend of mine, um, and I didn't realize that his mother had passed. And when he told me, I was like gutted. I, I felt awful. I felt like the worst kind of person on the earth, and I apologized. And I learned to stop making your mama jokes. Um, but when it comes to race, oftentimes we, we delegit delegitimize complaints. Um, we push back and say, you know what, the burden of change isn't with me, it's with you, the marginalized. Um, and we as marginalized people can do that ourselves sometimes. We can, we can demand that we be listened to without first realizing that uh, the person on the other end is also uh, a person endowed with experiences and perspective, and we also have to consider that as well. Uh, not to say that we have to validate it, but um, we also require patience when uh, framing our arguments as well. And I'll close off with this. Words are the most powerful tool that you have at your disposal. Use them wisely. Um, again, sparing an extra second of thought or an extra inch of patience can really go a long way, especially when you're dealing with something as touchy as race. And that's it. Thank you very much.